Let's talk about race. You know, you can't see the money can't be eaten. Assassins, right? It's where you be. Once again. But I got some help for you. Check this out. Here's the escalator. World dominator. Miseducator. Boom, toon, walk to the devil's lair. This virus of racist faces contagious to all types of places. Gotta peel layers off, and it ain't gonna get done soft. Discussion can stave off the bussin', fussin', bum rushin'. Politicians filibusterin', ways to usher in eugenetic disruption. Won't terrorize those with open eyes, not dealing with fakes who just wanna sit around and theorize. Meanwhile, in the street, another pair of police state hate related victims. The mind's eyes lay lifeless Looking at concrete Many topics, many ways to drop it Welcome, everyone, to the opening the door to racial dialogue hosted by the Racial Justice Collaborative. When we're going over this, we're going to be addressing the topics that we have begun with and continued through over the course of the year of 2021. And that starts with the beginning of that history, and that is the theft of land and the expulsion of people from that land in this country, part of America's original sin, removing the people, and then how later systems would continue to corroborate and exacerbate those issues continuing forward into modernity. All of this is connected to interlocking systems of power and how the theft and enslavement of people were brought into the colonies of the New World in order to make the land and the resources found in that land profitable. Those resources were then harvested and sent to Europe, where there were factories and industry in order to turn that raw resource into finished goods, which were then distributed to the rest of the partners in this trade, this triangle trade. This is a very important aspect of how all of this continued because it links to both manners of states and colonies that weren't as directly invested into the direct ownership over enslaved Africans, for example, which is how many people envision the full extent of the slave trade, but the slave trade is far more complicated than that. It involved shipbuilding, it involved major ports of entry, and all of these things are tied to other colonies besides just those of the Deep South with the large-scale plantations. In addition, a lot of these things, a lot of these industries and companies have direct corporate lineage to modern companies as well as many of these companies that exist in the modern day are literally just old enough to have had direct ties into dealing with things like insurance of enslaved people and other industries such as that. All of this is tied together into how all of these interconnected systems continued to propagate the vast and... Uh, extensive network that is known as the triangle trade. The most famous resource harvested in the United States during uh, the height of slavery is, of course, cotton. And cotton was a very important resource because 
uh, invented a newly invented machine at the time allowed it to be harvested and cleaned at such a rate. So because it became so much more profitable to have people enslaved, that many more people were enslaved, both in terms of higher number of people brought in through major ports, and eventually when that was outlawed, through an increase in the uh, productivity of the internal slave trade. As every American should know, the end of slavery on the federal and nationwide level, of course, had to come through conflict of arms with the southern states seceding and forming the confederacy in order to continue the practice of slavery as that was the financial base of their entire way of life for the uh, for the uh, you know uh, any sort of meaningful capacity the civil war of course was brought about for a variety of reasons all related to slavery but the morality of slavery is often overhyped from particularly the Northern Yankee perspective and the history of the event itself. But regardless, at the end of the Civil War, it resulted in the defeat of the Confederacy, the end of the attempted secession, and the end of slavery. However, slavery ending abruptly without any meaningful transition led to further difficulties. There were, of course, planned efforts of transition, such as the field order given by General Sherman of the Union, which was to have parcels of land divvied up from the former planter class of the South, which was, of course, the leader of the Confederacy, the lead social class, and given in small parcels to families of the formerly enslaved in the process that would be known as uh, 40 acres and a mule, quite self-explanatory. However, this process never came about. It made it to Congress, but never made it past or through the legislative branch and therefore was effectively dead. There was small aspects of trans uh, transitionary uh, protocol and transitionary uh, oversight, but these things were largely killed during Reconstruction as it was deemed far more socially and politically important to appease the Southern planter class and reintegrate them back into the Union rather than to protect the newly freed Black population. And so they were largely ignored. This newly freed Black population was largely left to perish in the way of overexposure, left out of sight and out of mind. and perhaps simply left to die completely. However, as anyone living in the modern day could attest to, obviously the black population of the United States did not just completely die, regardless of how little was done in order to prevent such a fate from happening. And so with such things, new processes and new laws were put in place in order to maintain and regulate this newly freed Black population. This started with the Black Codes, often thought of and referred to as slavery under another name. The Black Codes were, of course, the spiritual predecessor to the later Jim Crow laws, where you would just have a social, completely other set of standards and principles to hold freed Black populations against compared to their white citizenry uh, counterparts. Another important thing that came from the Jim Crow era that came as a direct succession, uh, direct uh, uh, succession to the Black Codes were the social caricatures that came out of Jim Crow, which many people are still very familiar with in the modern day. This is where a lot of these specific social and visual stereotypes associated with Black people truly reached uh, their uh, height and were able to be further propagated throughout the American social consciousness. And unfortunately, forms of media and entertainment simply for the purpose of mocking Black people. 
as the social interaction between the United States and its freed Black population continued to develop, it reached all forms of new heights, particularly under a number of legal cases that would continue to uphold practices of, of racial segregation and maintain status quo while claiming to be progressive in some way or another. Whereas former legal codes, such as the Black Codes, wouldn't have even attempted to claim to be equal in any moral or social capacity, the later claims, such as the Plessy versus Ferguson separate but equal cases, would claim to be aiding or beneficial to the Black population by giving equal treatment, or at least claiming to. It was very obvious to any observing it in any legitimate or open sense of observation that that was far from the truth and that it was still very much a tremendously two-tiered system of Black people receiving massively less and facing significantly more scrutiny, punishment, and difficulty. All of this built up and built up and built up massively to the point in which it faced backlash, significant backlash by Black populations, particularly Black populations that received training and experience in battle through being veterans of such American conflicts like the First World War. These veterans would return, help to organize communities, and resist these massively overreaching and oppressive laws that were put in place. Though many of these revolts, many of these uh, miniature revolutions, so to speak, were successful in many ways, a lot of them faced tremendous and brutal uh, suppression to the point in which entire communities throughout uh, many parts of the United States were simply destroyed, bloodied, and gruesome treatment can simply be uh, traced to removing entire communities and cultures off the map in many ways. As the relationship between African Americans and the United States would continue to develop, the particular trend of African Americans continuing to serve in the armed forces would continue going into future conflicts such as the Second World War. And there were benefits that were supposed to be offered to any and all soldiers that were contributing in the Second World War, such as the GI Bill, among others. These things, however, never properly reached the Black populations of the United States. And many of those benefits that would go on to be foundations for many families and Americans' ways of life, financial securities, and foundations for homes and uh, family bases, these things were simply skipped over for the Black populations, leading to a continued economic segregation and economic depression that continues to affect Black people to the present day. You have a tremendous wealth gap as a result of this. You have white families that, due to processes like the GI Bill, when their ancestors fought and bravely contributed in the Second World War and the cause of the Allies, their families were able to afford houses, which had tremendous uh, capital, they had great wealth, and these things were able to be financial bedrock for the populations that would come later in their families, and rightfully so. However, Black people were not able to be granted the same benefits, despite them being supposedly able to be granted the exact same rights as their white counterparts that also served as veterans in the Second World War. A lot of these things are the exact foundations that cause the modern wealth gap and why so few Black people have intergenerational wealth and assets from one generation to the next compared to their white counterparts. This relationship would continue and continue and continue until eventually a number of groundbreaking cases would begin to finally seem to make change during the civil rights era. A certain example of this is the 
Brown versus Board of Education case in which legal segregation was finally considered to be inherently unequal in circumstances such as public education. This was incredibly important as these massive divides that have been in place for decades were finally starting to shift, but it would be a while before these things would give and there would be great backlash from white society for these things starting to change. There are all sorts of issues that came in results of things like this, but a great example is the Boston busing crisis in which there were tons upon tons of mobs and just violence against children that were going to be integrated into these new school systems. My family personally in the Boston busing crisis was heavily affected in this with my father being one of those children that were this taunted and uh, physically uh, threatened by these grown adults throwing stones and bottles and brandishing weapons against these children simply for integrating as the law deemed. The relationship is ever changing, ever developing, and as things seem to improve, there are still countless issues that need to be faced and overcome to continue. One of these very important things, particularly in the uh, modern day, is the relationship between African Americans and uh, undue imprisonment and uh, disproportionate imprisonment for all manner of crimes, especially such things as nonviolent crimes and possession of narcotics, which now in the year of 2021 are perfectly legal and massively monopolized by massive white-owned corporations. All of this history, all of these things together blend into the overarching system of white supremacy. Historically based and continually perpetuated through manners of culture, interaction, and all aspects of daily life within the United States and abroad all culminate into this organization of power which oppresses those on the lower end and props up those on the higher echelon, which of course in this system is those of European descent in the United States. It's important for us to be able to speak to developing resistance. We need to be able to understand the history what came before in order to know what to do next. It's important to understand these things so that we have the mental fortitude and the emotional strength to do something about these things. It's an ongoing dialogue. It is a constant skill that needs to be refined. And these things are a great way in order to help do those things for yourself. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about race. Let's talk about race.